Good morning to our wonderful Easter service, Easter weekend service. And if you tuned in this morning, I hope you have a wonderful experience, maybe with some friends, maybe with family, as you're enjoying sitting, looking around, and just being in the fellowship of believers and Christians. We are celebrating today our Easter resurrection service. So this service's main purpose is to help us focus on the, res the resurrection. And what did it mean? What does it mean in your life and me and my life? And so I'm trying to work around the theme, I see him as if for the first time. I see him as if for the first time. But won't you just join me with a prayer? Lord, thank you for bringing us after this wonderful weekend together. Thank you for being in our hearts, showing us the way, working in our hearts with the thoughts from sermon to sermon, from scripture reading to scripture reading. You are there, challenging us, growing us. Thank you that you didn't leave us this week, but that you worked in us and that you are completing your work in us. We ask you now to be part of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. I greet you once again in the most powerful name that is known to man in the universe. It is the name of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. It is the name of God, our Father, who cares for us. And it is in the name of the Holy Spirit who shows us who Jesus is. Accept the blessing and accept God's love as it is extended to you. You remember what the early Christians used to say? They didn't say, like we have the expression, seeing is believing. Now, isn't that true? You want to buy a car and someone says, I first have to see it. Someone is selling you something, you say, just show it to me. So it's not seeing is believing, and, but the Christians then coined the phrase and they said, no, 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 it's first believing, then seeing. And, and it could be true, but you remember what the Christians did, the early first generation Christians, when they realized that Christ has risen, that was the way that they greeted each other from that day on. They said, Christ has risen. So maybe if you just turn to the person you are looking now or just say it out loud, out loud, Christ has risen. And then the response is, indeed, he has risen. Christ has risen. Indeed, he has risen. But it's not true for everybody because some people still want to see and believe. Some people want to still be enticed. So let us start. We, we left this discussion last on Friday when we said God works with inconsistencies. God works when he challenges us with our own humanness, but when he brings it in contact with his godly character. And something happens there. So I'm asking you the question. I wonder what happened up to now. Did you maybe have a question that you worked, uh, worked with or walked with and you thought, how, how is this possible? Was there maybe some growth in the way that you are thinking about people or the things that you said, I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing this because it seems to me that God is in this and I don't know how. What came to you? because you listened to God in Scripture just the past few days? That's my question to you. Now, seeing is believing. The first thing that we, we actually need to do, and if you have your Bible, we, we started off reading chapter 18 and 19 in the Gospel of John. But now we're in the Gospel of John chapter 20. Now, chapter 20 is the resurrection uh, chapter. So if you want to just open your Bible, and read chapter 20. Once again, I'm going to ask you to, to pause the video, read it slowly, read the whole chapter, and read it a few times. And what I want you to look at is movement. See the movement of the characters in the story, because I think that is the clue to understanding what John is trying to convey to us. Remember, John has got a message for the reader of this gospel. He's not trying to give us the camera shot that's taking everything into account and you know you have to decide. He has already made the selection and he wants us to follow the cues. So just see movement. Who is moving where and when? 
And what are they succeeding in when they move or don't move? Is there maybe someone refusing to move in the story and can you associate with it? Or are you the kind of person that's always on the move and that's why the movement in the passage actually stimulates you? Are you someone that can associate with the people that you see in the text. So as you read it, ask yourself these kind of questions. This uh, passage starts, and when it says, and I'm now re uh, reading from the New Living Translation, early Sunday morning when it was still dark. It says, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone was rolled aside from the entrance. And then she utters these words. She ran to found, and she found Simon Peter and in this uh, version he says, and me, and said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and I don't know where they have put him. And you'll find that this phrase is repeated three times. Three times Mary says something. Now let us just start with how this chapter starts. It says, early the Sunday morning when it was still dark. Now let's just see what the... The movement in this passage is, the movement is from darkness to light, from walking to running, from just staring to really looking, from refusing to accepting. We read later on that Thomas is the one that says, Lord, I will not if I do not. And he puts up, uh, he says, this is my, uh, this is my uh, precondition. If I do not this and, and, and something happens. So the first thing that I think we should see is that there is movement on the backdrop of this text. The movement is, it is dark and it is not just dark because the lights are off and it's very early, that too. But it's also on a second level trying to convey to us a darkness version. A lot of people are still in the dark. The second level meaning is actually asking and like I said it creeps off the page. And it jumps onto the floor and it's actually coming to your side and it asks you if you and I like Mary are still in the dark in the early morning which could be or could not be a good uh, experience, but there's movement here and it comes from darkness. Mary is the one going out and she's got this expectation. She wants to find Jesus. She's going to the tomb. Now remember, the tomb is a, a round stone that was rolled in front of the opening. What's so interesting is that this tomb was close to the place where Jesus was crucified. Close because there was no time to take him somewhere else. He was alone in the grave because there was, it was a new grave. That's what the text says. It was newly dug. There was no other body. So it's not possible to mistake Jesus with some other person that's already in the grave. There's only one person. And it, it is close. That's why Jesus' disciples could run there. Now they, they are running. But who's the person running? It's Mary Magdalene. Mary. So who's Mary? Mary is not... In a sense, Jesus' mother, she's not a good uh, friend. In one of the texts we read that Mary is the person of whom Jesus expelled seven demons. She's someone that has experienced Jesus personally. And she's got, a, she's, she's got invested now with Jesus' story. So she's running, so she's running. And as she's running, she stops and she says, Oh goodness, the body is gone. And now she's expecting that Jesus would be there. She's expecting the, the dead body, nay, Jesus lying there, or at least seeing the tomb that will give her the confidence that she knows where he is. She can mourn. And then the story comes with a surprise. Mary runs, she talks with the, the, the disciples, she says to them, I've seen that the tomb is empty. Nay, they've moved the body. The two disciples come, they see the tomb is empty and they run. They come from walking to running. There's transition that's taking place from light to darkness, from walking to running, from questioning what you are actually seeing. Isn't it true that when matters of faith are at play, we are looking in a new way? 
And this passage especially wants to challenge the way that we look at things. It doesn't want to say us, don't look with your eyes. It wants to tell us that there is different ways of looking at the reality in front of you. If I can quote from a book by Henry Nowen, Finding My Way Home. He says, let's look, let's take a look at our world from a distance. Not from the physical distance of a plane or a space vehicle, but from the spiritual distance of faith. Let us look at ourselves, at our humanity from above and with the eyes of God. Jesus always looks at the human condition from above and tries to teach us to look as he did. I come from above, he said, and I want you to be reborn from above so that you will be able to see with new eyes. So let's just see what is what is happening in in this text if we just look at the movement. At the backdrop there is movement. It is not stale. It is not stagnant. And so the message that's conveyed to us in this text is, in a sense, how stagnant are you? How, how, how still are you doing the same things that you did previously? Are you still the walking kind or not? Have, have you made the transition to some other direction in your faith? Because the movement in the text suggests there is movement necessary in this faith to get to the point where you understand what it meant, you and I have to question our own sitting, our own standing, our own not believing. So Mary three times says, I'm looking for Christ. And then suddenly, suddenly Jesus moves. But what we should see is Jesus moves on his time. Previously, Mary was the one taking the initiative. Mary was the one knowing where Jesus is. Mary was the one moving where Jesus is. And she could found him where she knew he was going to be. But something took place. Jesus was resurrected. And the resurrection says to us everything that was said by Jesus and about Jesus up to this point suddenly could be true. This is what the text is suggesting. Everything up to this point which wasn't believed, now can be believed. So this is a new chapter starting. It's a new chapter starting not just for the disciples who are wondering, but it is a new chapter for us, the reader. When we get between to page uh, uh, chapter 19, Jesus is in the grave and there's still doubt. But when Jesus is resurrected, a new chapter starts. And this new chapter wants to also come to us and ask if you have started your new chapter. It wants to ask you if God is so much part of your life that you will allow him to do the movement. Jesus comes and he asks as the gardener in this text. He says, Maria, why are you crying? And she says, just tell me where you have put him. And then he says, Maria. And she says, Rabuni. Jesus says, don't hold on to me. And I think that don't hold on to me is so apt because we respond differently when Jesus approaches us. But we first have to, like I read in the previous time, and I'm going to read it to you again. We have to sometimes, to get us on the move, see people that's moving. So let's just look at someone that's moving by this little story. From Blue Like Jazz, the author said, I never like jazz music because jazz music doesn't resolve. And you know jazz music. But I was outside the Baghdad Theater in Portland one night and I saw a man playing the saxophone. I stood there for 15 minutes and he never opened his eyes. After that, I liked jazz music. Sometimes you have to watch somebody love something before you can love it yourself. It is as if they are showing you the way. I used not to like God because God didn't resolve. But he says, but that was before all of this happened. Couldn't this just be your kind of start of your story? You didn't like God. Things didn't make sense. But when we look at Mary and the expression she has on her face. And the way she's approaching Jesus, she's not stopping once, she's going three times. When we see her running to Jesus and holding on to him, 
doesn't that just touch your heart? Doesn't that just say to you, to Mary, you didn't have to say Jesus was resurrected in theology. She knew it by touching. But what we should see is that Jesus approached her on his timing. The resurrected Jesus comes into our lives on his timing. He comes when he sees it fit. When he knows right when to come into our lives. He didn't come after the first time she talked. He didn't come after the second time. It was only after the third time that Mary said, where have they put him, that Jesus moved. And he knew that was the godly timing to move into her life to get her to realize what it means to be with the resurrected Jesus. The second story we read is the story of Thomas. Thomas says, I will not believe this, although you other guys may believe, I will not believe this. And the story stops there. Jesus doesn't, doesn't then come and appear suddenly. But it says in the, in the scripture, verse uh, 26, eight days later the disciples were together. Thomas was with them, the doors were locked, and then suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing amongst them, greeting them. The story is not conveying the message, Jesus is a ghost and he just walks through doors. The story is conveying Jesus moves into our lives at his timing. The resurrected Jesus moves. And he moves into the way that we are stagnant, not believing, doubting. The way that we are still confused in our own story. And he comes to do what? To resolve. He comes to bring some kind of an outcome that says, this is Jesus. He wants to convince you and me. That it, yes, seeing is believing. But then Jesus says just later, he says, you know, blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. And in this verse 29, Jesus opens the door for all of us who only see by looking at the other disciples. At the Thomases, as, at the disciples, at the Marys. He says, you know what, you and I can still believe. To do what? Believe and be saved? No, believe and live. Believe and live, not now, but every day, a new kind of way. It's not be saved and then go home and have your own way. It's live in the presence of the resurrected Christ who moves into your life. So the question, once the question mark is, are you in a movement situation where you allow God to move into your life? When you celebrate the cross, is it just a cross on the hill, the lone cross on a lonely hill, stagnant, there's no movement, and the story has actually read, uh, got to a full stop? Or can you see that it's not a full stop, it's a comma. The story continues. The story continues as Jesus starts moving into your life and my life. Are you the kind of disciple that still are open to it. And this story suggests be open. Because Jesus says in the passage, he says, he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit in verse 22. He blew and he breathed on them. He says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are un unforgiven. Jesus starts and he says, when I come into your life, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, because of what has just happened? The biggest event ever when Jesus moves across in Greek thinking from Hades where no movement is possible and he brings life to the dead situations. Are you allowed to move with your thought and with your feet? And you're allowed and I'm allowed to start saying, Lord, I need, we allowed to start yearning for movement. A movement where God moves where we say god i'm sitting and i'm ready for you to move and show me what this resurrected christ means because i know it is not stagnant it is not the cross it's a living walking talking jesus in our lives i hope you have some experience this morning that because of the cross where jesus started but where he died and then was resurrected, there is life in your life possible. Jesus says there's movement possible. Jesus says there's new opportunities possible. 
Jesus says you have to believe it, even if you cannot see it. So our challenge is to start looking with God's eyes at our own humanity. To see how will God see you and me in the, in the life that we are living. Do we have the opportunities or are we just on the run? And I'm sure you and I have that kind of friends. They're always on the run, always on the cell phone, never there's a time you can't even reach them. Maybe that's just an expression of who we are, the busyness that we're caught up to. This story wants to tell us there's movement when we start searching, there's movement when we start reaching out, there's movement in the discussion about God, but the resurrected Christ moves on His time, exactly at the right time. To bring exactly the right movement you and I need. But you have to believe it. That he doesn't just come to bring you to a better spot. He is the life he wants to bring into your life. I hope that you can trust this morning. That if you look around where you are sitting. That when you look with your eyes. You can agree seeing is believing. But you can also believe. Because I believe, I look differently. Believing is seeing. On the other hand, I see for the first time. Maybe you can just look around you and start seeing for the first time the wonders that was locked up in this wonderful story. This wonders that's conveyed to you. This questions that's jumping off the page and biting you on the shin. Jesus wants to say to you, come. Come and join the story. Come and join the story of the resurrected Christ. And then he says there's a way to live. Forgive people their sins. Forgive the people around you what they have done. Start looking with God's intention and God's life. Because your life is now part of God. I hope that you see a sense of wonder. And that you feel God move and that your life doesn't stay at the point where it is because you're interacting from the kingdom reality that God has placed in you. May the scripture become truly alive. May you start focusing, pausing, allowing movement into, back into your story. As you say, I see, but with God's eyes, I see God's things. Be blessed and do a prayer with me as we enjoy what God has done for us. Lord, as we read your scripture, it's always mind-boggling, but it's so straight. You come and you move on your time and you touch us. And when we are engaged in reaching out, you come and you will change our lives. You will show to us that the resurrected Christ was meant for us. Our broken stories, our broken hearts. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you didn't leave us alone. Thank you that we had one more chance to engage with Jesus Christ and the story of Jesus Christ. Help us, and this, this is my prayer for each one listening. Help us to be the ones who see Jesus in other people, but then also to believe when we do not see. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Please accept the blessing. May you experience Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, when you go out. May you experience the Holy Spirit walking with you, showing you the way. And may you experience all behind this, Jesus saying to you, This is the Father that loves you. This is the kind of love that's meant for you. And may you engage with it and revel in it. In Jesus' name, be blessed and go well.